creo que vamos a empezar. Esto es el panel sobre, bueno, la mesa redonda sobre innovaciones en América Latina. Eh, bueno, muchas gracias por estar aquí, muchas gracias por mostrar un interés en la región. Eh, América Latina sin duda es una de las regiones más impactadas por la guerra contra las drogas. Escuchamos en las noticias todos los días sobre estos impactos y para muchas activistas de los Estados Unidos solo escuchan de esa parte. Pero hoy vamos a hablar de innovaciones, vamos a hablar de todo lo que está sucediendo donde hay esperanza, donde hay reforma, donde hay ciertos avances en Uruguay, el debate en México y también un poco sobre el proceso en la Organización de Estados Americanos, los informes que han salido. Tal vez han escuchado algo de eso, pero no conocen muy bien cómo es. Vamos a hablar cómo está pasando la cosa, el tema de política de drogas en, en toda la región y en las organizaciones multilaterales que, que nos controlan a veces y a veces nos dan oportunidades. También sabemos que, que a nivel regional e internacional los países están impulsando cambios, que fue México, Colombia y Guatemala que pidieron una sesión especial en las Naciones Unidas. Pero ¿qué están haciendo a nivel local? ¿Qué está pasando dentro de sus países? Entonces vamos a empezar un poco en ese, en ese rango. Por fortuna tenemos un grupo de personas que conocen muy bien el tema, el contexto y los cambios que, que están sucediendo. Hanna y yo estamos muy agradecidos que todos están aquí, muchas gracias y a todos ustedes también por estar aquí. Vamos a empezar. Buen día a todos, voy a presentarles a nuestros panelistas, empezando a mi izquierda tenemos a Julio Calzada, secretario general de la Junta Nacional de Drogas del Uruguay, Fernando Belanzarán, diputado federal de México, Pablo Zimmerman, coordinador de Relaciones Internacionales de la, de la Asociación Civil Intercambios de Argentina, Marcela Tobar, consultora de Acción Técnica Social en Colombia, Pedro Abrabobay, director del programa América Latina y el Caribe de la Open Society Foundation, y Ernesto Cortés, de la Asociación Costarricense de Estudios e Intervención en Drogas. Bueno, no sé si quieres decir quién para qué. Ah, y yo soy Hannah Hetzer, um, Drug Policy Manager. Representatives in the Senate. It was discussed during eight long months in the House of Representatives, but there was a special commission that was formed to um, to bring this to to fruit, which happened on August 31st by a vote in the House, and then it went to the Senate, where it is um, in the Senate Health Committee, and it will certainly be. Approved by by vote of the government in a couple of weeks, and the idea is that the president's going to be very happy to sign the bill. Correct? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. There's no reason to believe he won't. He's the one who, who motivated it, who pushed it, and he's the one who's made it possible uh, to to initiate this entire process of debate in Uruguay. And uh, almost there's nothing to indicate that that the law won't pass in the country. So that's the big difference between the initiatives here in the United States in Colorado. Washington. They were motivated uh, by popular vote, by citizen vote. And in Uruguay and in other countries, it's coming more from uh, the higher government levels. Fernando, uh, what's happening in Mexico now? Where's the debate? 
Yes, thank you. Thank you, Hannah, for um, inviting us to this panel. This year of debate that we've had in Mexico, what we're seeing is a growing debate because during the six years, if it's been uh, worth anything, it has shown us that the war against uh, drugs is, is pointless. Felipe Calderon, who is... He, He's, he's the one who has led us into this disastrous situation. We are much worse off than when this war against the drugs started. It began, and I'm talking more about when it escalated. And given these results, and given the reason, what's going on in the world, I presented an initiative to regulate marijuana two weeks after the referendums in Washington and Colorado. And of course, that has helped to change. We, we have a better climate to do that in, and it's been taken very seriously. The Mexican Congress, uh, as part of the Mexican government, decided to send a delegation to this convention, to this, um, to this uh, program. And we have uh, two of our uh, representatives here in the audience with us. In the federal district, we've also, the, the debate has also been promoted by um, uh, leaders in our community. Mexico City is the most open city. It's the only place in the country where we were able to um, uh, achieve uh, um, legal abortion. There's gay marriage. Um, and women's rights have had a lot of success, and that's me. In, in, in Mexico City, our representatives uh, have a different perspective, and what I would say is there's a strong debate, and it's been shown that the prohibition paradigm doesn't work, and it doesn't meet any of its goals. It creates a lot of undesirable, brutal consequences. There have been hundreds of thousands of deaths and people who have disappeared. It's a humanitarian crisis. Yesterday, I found out about something. We talk a lot about people who have died, about the murders, the high cost, but I see that the U.S., uh, the U United States has also pays a high price by the massive incarceration because of drugs. And, and we have paid a very high cost for something that has failed, and we want to build a different paradigm. And we asked the United Nations to have a meeting in, in, as a result of that failure. And I hope that the Mexican government will come to that meeting as a promoter of that new paradigm. Because if everything stays the same, that would be shameful and pathetic. So it's obvious that on both sides of the border that there are many problems associated with the uh, with the drug war uh, has massive jailing uh, uh, a lot of people in, in, in uh, Mexico, from Central America. We have we have heard a lot about the war against drugs, about the, um, uh, making drugs illegal, and uh, especially in Guatemala. Um, but I think that there is a possibility of reforms. What do you think now? And uh, what is your opinion? Well, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, uh, Anna. Well, in the Central American religion, despite the fact that it's a small uh, region, it has, uh, there are many differences. The northern countries, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, are living through a very different situation than the one that we live in um, Costa Rica and in Nicaragua. In fact. Uh, in Honduras, uh, they're living what you're living in Mexico. It's an open war. Homicides in Honduras, the rate of homicide is the highest rate in the world right now. The difference in Costa Rica, where we have a, context, a very different context, uh, in fact, uh, since uh, it's been 10 years that uh, uh, con drug consumption has been um, decriminalized, uh, the law. Um, the, the law, it's against uh, putting somebody somebody in jail for consuming drugs, and, and uh, uh, the, the, the Department of State uh, said that uh, it, it uh, made it possible for people to have, to be able to have the drugs, that it's been a, uh, there has 
been uh, uh, the social security system and the and the um, uh, health department have decided uh, have instituted this, and there has been a whole uh, slew of treatments for people who are um, in terms in regards to drug consumption. Uh, but there is an institute for uh, addiction, uh, drug and alcohol addiction that has been um, dealing with this issue for the past uh, 15 years. There's been a big change this past year. They reduced uh, the sentences for women that would uh, uh, that, uh, introduce uh, drug contraband into the jails. Uh, it had to do something with being uh, with fairness and uh, and, and parity. Uh, it, uh, 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 absorbing that this uh, in, in understanding that it, that it has to do with, with poverty and economic conditions. So in, in Costa Rica, it is going through a, a, a different situation. It has a uh, there is a different dynamic going on, and, um, and we look forward to organizing a conference. Uh, it would be a great event. Uh, it would be a great venue, and this would be the uh, it would be the. the uh, Fourth conference uh, on the drug policy, and, and it will be the first one that is Central Central American. For those that would like to go, it will be the drug the conference on drug policy in Costa Rica. So, so sometimes it's much easier to talk about just marijuana and the number of drugs, but there are. But we know of many frameworks in which they are discussing about other drugs in a very uh, creative way. Marcela, can you talk about what's going on in Colombia and what are you uh, implementing or experimenting with? Good morning. Well, in Colombia, you cannot, can, cannot be absent from the... Uh, it, 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 you cannot ignore the fact that we're consumers and we're producers. And, um, and that and we need to gain ground on both. We have uh, negotiations with the FRARC. Uh, where there has been, uh, there has been uh, and the government and the guerrillas have taken a position in, in relationship to um, the use of pesticides and uh, there has been very uh, detrimental effects in regards to the use of pesticides but also it affects the um, consumption and, and that areas um, of production and how the state's going to respond to that. We have gained ground in terms of the consumers of uh, psychotropics in, in Colombia. Um, after the, the Uribe initiative, in terms of the, uh, the amount of for personal concession, the, the, what came forth is the uh, Galand law that, uh, um, that forced institutions to provide treatment for folks that uh, are considered addicts. Now, there is a uh, self-conception. There is another thing that the state is uh, not able to carry out, but uh, the, a number of institutions that started instituting the exchange for needles. Uh, in Colombia, there's a, there's a high consumption of heroin, and there is a, a number of cases of uh, HIV. Uh, is where heroin is, is production is in the Pacific Coast, in the in the um, border of in the area of Pereira. Uh, near the Colombian border. So we're dealing with the uh, uh, high um, uh, rep state representatives that are the ones that are blockading the, uh, the distribution of needles and to deal with this issue, but I also work with the Secretary of State in, Bo in Bogota, and we're trying to carry out a chemical um, a study and about what the benefits of marijuana and that particular variety of marijuana uh, those that uh, are addicted to uh, coca paste, uh, people who uh, live in the streets and that and when they are in high need of the substance will carry out crimes to be able to get a few dollars, a few pesos. Uh, uh, in uh, in, in Uruguay they call it uh, Paco, and you might you guys might call it crack. Um, it's uh, it's consumed by the 
Those scene, uh, a lot of people who make them it has a lot of, uh, does a lot of harm to your body. It's also led to crime, and we also know that if you are, uh, if you deal, it causes a lot of anxiety, and it uh, it leads to more crimes. But there can be a, a transition to a healthier kind of consumption, or to or the end of uh, the addiction. And uh, we're trying to document this and to anecdotal evidence uh, and the use of anecdotal evidence is to deal with the bigger problems. That that's one of the problem, bigger problems we have. We don't have any kind of evidence that. Uh, any kind of studies that uh, deal with us. So you have to share your results with us. Yeah, you have to have the supporters to, to get the evidence. It's very difficult to do clinical studies about this. Well, we need right now the support of, from the national government because as you can imagine, there are problems uh, from the legal perspective. And you, you, there are 19 plans. Uh, each person has allowed to have each plans for personal consumption. Uh, so, in so in social uh, civil uh, in civil spaces, we can we can create a network of um, among uh, in individuals to create, uh, develop certain varieties. But then you have uh, authorization from the National Council of uh, uh, Drug uh, to that. That they are willing to experiment with uh, 15,000 plants to try to carry out uh, scientific studies, but we uh, we have not been authorized because the, um, the the National Drug Policy Council has blocked it. Very interesting reforms in Latin America, but what do these changes mean for the region? Uh, Pablo, what has been the role of international organizations like the OAS? Uh, the Organization of American States uh, in relation to this. Uh, hello, uh, good morning. Um, well, it's true that the social organizations are trying to fight for, to reform uh, drug policy for many years, in the last few years, maybe because of the changes, important changes that the different governments have gone through uh, uh, um, going towards more um, uh, going towards uh, more progressive governments. Uh, what we're doing, uh, some of the initiatives and some of the changes, I think, affect in terms of the multilater multilateral organizations that are organizations that are formed by governments, that are they are the governments that should be giving the leadership so that the, um, their departments of states can work on these things. Uh, now, there is also, there was a very important threshold that was uh, crossed in the region, that which was the formation of the Latin American uh, Commission uh, that was formed by different uh, ex-presidents that began to discuss the failure of the drug policies, and shortly after that, uh, also some current presidents began to uh, express such opinions. This rapid chronology that I'm putting together and at the summit of the Americas in Cartagena that took place last year, the President Santos put forward a debate uh, in that uh, summit. It wasn't very fruitful, um, but it uh, forced the OAS Secretariat to carry out uh, to elaborate a, a report of what's the situation and the results of drug policies in the regions. As a result of that work, we have two reports, one that, uh, um, that it's uh, an analysis and another one that describes different scenarios that, that uh, describes, it's useful because of what would be the possible scenarios depending on the, what uh, steps government take. And uh, in those scenarios, you can see some of the things that we've been, been proposing, things like the ones that have been done with the results that we all we're all familiar with, the OAS has, um, has played is beginning to play a role, a prominent role, 
in this debate. And this year, we began to the General Assembly of the OAS. Uh, for the first time, we had as a central issue the discussion on on the drug issue. That assembly uh, had a resolution that includes so, some of the uh, issues that we've been putting forward. But, but uh, there was no consensus on some of the more difficult issues, uh, more controversial issues, and, uh, and the idea is to try to, but this gives us some time to continue to think about these issues and to come back uh, to uh, an, uh, a specialist, uh, to convene a special assembly, maybe in October in uh, uh, Antigua, Guatemala. This process of the OAS is going hand in hand with the, uh, another assembly of the OAS, like the Pan American uh, Health Organization, uh, and he made a, a statement in this previous assembly, and has re reaffirmed that, has put forward the drug issue as a healthcare issue, and to uh, and basing its the steps is taken on uh, on the studies and on the issues of human rights. This issue had never been put forth in on in writing before, uh, and now uh, there is at least a discourse. There's a change in the agencies that could help and f uh, be favorable to the, uh, the uh, to the steps that some of the governments that are taking place, uh, and to to provide support to the. Uh, um, initiatives that uh, civil society is putting forward. And I think that it's interesting to me that I would like to share with some of my colleagues here is the high visibility that this is having, uh, what's, uh, what's happening in the Americans is having. I, I, uh, I have been attending conferences of DPA, and there has always been, there's always been a, a panel about Latin America, so we have to take uh, some of the panel had to come down from the podium in order to be part of, uh, of those who were attending, and, uh, um, and there was very little interest uh, among in the American society and and, uh, and among the participants of the DPA conferences. But the interest that this is uh, 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 awakening now, this strengthens the work that we're doing. It it gives it more visibility, uh, and on the other hand, it, it enables us to be able to. Uh, come back and to be able to carry out the, uh, the, the activities that we're doing. Thank you very much. Um, You've been talking about the processes in institutions and governments, but what about public opinion? What's happening? What do people think in your countries? If you want to talk about Brazil, please, you could tell us a little bit, but it's not necessary. Pedro. Uh, only if you want to. And, and what's been the influence of the church, the Catholic Church? What's been that influence? Hello. Good morning, first of all. I think that as far as public opinion goes, if you look at the region, there exists a certain position that's very similar amongst almost all the countries in the region. When you ask somebody about uh, drug legalization in general, it's a, you get a very negative response. Of course, countries are changing a little, but generally speaking, about 78% are against it. It's not the same when you ask them about marijuana. In many countries, in some cities, it, it's different, but generally, in that's our reality in our region. You know, you could look at those numbers and you could say, uh, let's change the subject. Let's uh, work on something else. But the reality of those numbers is that they are starting to change. And I think there's some things we need to understand. To understand those numbers and how to deal with them. The first thing that we need to realize is that we're talking about a subject that for 50 years there was a single ideology. It was, it, it's, it's been imposed on generations. People, I mean, nowadays, even people who are 78 years old grew up with and their sole experience 
against while they grew up was a world in which the ideology was a war against drugs that was imposed on them, and specifically in Latin America. That, that imposition from the outside, from the north, has been very strong. And so we're talking about starting to work with prejudices that are inculcated in everybody's consciousness. I think that the, that the American example, uh, it doesn't work there. Because in 1997, here in the United States, when 73% of the American population was against marijuana legalization, and now 58% of people are in favor of it, that shows us first that it's possible to change. And change here has a lot to do, of course there are many reasons, but I think it has a lot to do with um, the stigma, the idea of medical marijuana, that a marijuana consumer isn't necessarily a, uh, just the idea of a person who's a young, a young guy with related to crime and everything, you know. When you start seeing that it could be um, executives, uh, uh, middle-aged ladies, the, um, when that stigma starts to change, then the ideology of the war against drugs starts to, it starts to occur to people that it's inconsistent. So I think there's a lot of work to do in Latin America, and we need to believe that it's possible to break the stigma. I think that there's something else. The fact that there are agendas that have been blocked for many time because they weren't of um, popular interest. It was very hard to talk about those subjects. But poli traditional political organizations, unions, parties, they weren't interested in it. They might have had opinions. And I was in the government for eight years, and I know that a lot of people say, I agree with you guys, but I can't talk about that in public. And that creates a, a vicious cycle because people then, nobody's going to talk. And it's the only way, if, if it's the only road to take, what do you do? The, the innovation are the new. Um, the, the new communication devices, social media, the internet. People are being able to uh, work with agendas that used to be blocked, even if it's against the party's will or against traditional organizations. But we have the example of the Iwana March. Uh, there were always a whole lot of people in the, in the streets, and after that phenomenon, no party supported it, no union supported it, but they had 10,000 people in the street in the cities. So there's a possibility of change to mobilize people now. And lastly, I think something that's important to say is change. When some politicians talk about the subject and have social society, civil society supporting them. It, it, it's hard to um, find allies in this sometimes, but we have to create alliances and partnerships around that subject. For example, how the Latin American Commission has uh, been, been, been formed by a president who didn't necessarily have a strong relationship with uh, the progressive movements in their countries. And a lot of them uh, resisted support, but support of civil society in these movements is, is, is fundamental. And it can be a real uh, change in with connections with society. As far as the Catholic Church, I think, sure, uh, Pope was in Latin America recently, and and it's been a big surprise because he didn't talk about anything about morality, hardly. He didn't talk about gay marriage, he didn't talk about abortion. Everyone was expecting that. He chose one subject to talk about. 
from a conservative standpoint, of course, but he talked about drugs. And he said two things. The first thing he said was that it's important to have compassion and to take care of consumers. Now, that's not the policy of uh, most Latin American countries. When we see how treatment is carried out, um, we don't see care and compassion or solidarity, not Christian or otherwise. To the contrary, they're, torturous, they're torture houses throughout the continent. And that's, and that's how uh, treatment exists in most countries. Having the church as an ally to really think about um, decriminalizing for consumers, and I think it's, it's possible. The other thing the Pope said was that he was very concerned that many Latin American leaders were talking about a world of free drug use, and he said that was very bad, and I think we all agree with the Pope on that. I mean, uh, not everyone, but... But, but what is free use of drugs? Maybe we're, that's what we're seeing today, in Brazil at least. Uh, you want access to crack or, or marijuana or whatever. Easy, easy enough. Um, free access is, is easy. If a kid wants access to those things, he can get it, no problem. I think the Uruguayan example is different. They say we want responsible regulation, not a free use. Alcohol is subject to free use. People can have free access to it. In Brazil nowadays, where the Pope was, we have events like the uh, World uh, Soccer Championship that's sponsored by, a, a, by, by drug companies. I mean, I'm talking about alcohol companies, and that's free use. And I think that's where the debate needs to be. When the church says that it's against free use, open use, then we have to set a debate to say, exactly, exactly. There's a program that we have in the area that's free use of drugs, and now we have to uh, exercise uh, responsible regulation on drugs that are legal and illegal. Perfect. This is very um, shocking that in a few years that public opinion changed to be in favor of legalization of almost 30% change. But here our, our policies are a little behind the, uh, the process here. It's a reverse uh, process. We're talking about the public, uh, talking about, we're going to open it for a round of questions for the panels or for specific panelists. Uh, if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand. We're going to take these four questions and then we're going to let them add, respond. Okay? If you can raise your hands again. There was one there. Um, otherwise, we're going to do another round at the end. Can I, can I ask in English? Yes. What has been the, the role that uh, social movements, human rights organizations, uh, grassroots organizations, and what has been the, the impact that uh, uh, top-down processes have, take, have, have have on this? On this. I have two questions. I have a comment and a question. My comment is that last week I was in El Salvador and I was surprised to see that the, uh, the, the 
who's playing a role in calling out for change in drug policy is uh, and, and for a more health-oriented uh, perspective is the evangelical church. The evangelical church plays a very conservative role, but I think that there is a whole uh, universe of uh, a uh, actors in this uh, scenario that we sometimes want to take into account. And I would like to ask also if I could ask if there is some kind of uh, initiative, I don't know if at local or state level, to modify the, the uh, drug policy today or, or if the issue is, is uh, not going anywhere right now. Um, hello, thank you. Uh, my name is David Dillinger and I, uh, I was born and raised in Miami and then, uh, now I'm a researcher in criminal justice. I have a question for the representatives from Mexico and Colombia, uh, and maybe also the men from, Me from Brazil. Almost all these problems that we're trying to change uh, they're interrelated. They're um, for example, from 2008 to 2008 in Mexico, the production of heroin uh, has multiplied many times. Before 2007, and the problem with the drug cartels is that they were uh, more tied to marijuana. Um, this problem with marijuana is not just marijuana because the cartels are going to remain after the reforms. And now that when we're talking about the changes that we can that we can that we can do, the changes have to have they will they will have their own consequences. And I think this problem, I think, is. We have to do a coordinated effort, a concentrated effort, not just to, to, not just in one country, but in a number of countries. But not just, but not just in one market. If you could, if you could use the microphone so they can, they can interpret. Thank you. Uh, the next round, I'm going to ask. But if you could go to. Um, Ms. Maria, quickly, the one that's in front of Good morning, uh, dear. Uh, and gentlemen. I want to talk about, I want to discuss an issue that uh, our representative came from Mexico to talk about. Uh, he talked about, well, we know right now that the, the most important issue is the legalization of marijuana. But he just discussed a problem that it's. Uh, that is uh, critical in Mexico. If uh, my sisters can you please stand up, we're victims of the war that is being carried out against uh, uh, organized crime, supposedly. But we know that this war was carried out against society. I am a mother. Uh, I have four of my sons are disappeared. We have been in all the in all the meetings. We have been everywhere uh, where we think that we can get support. I want to ask. I want to ask a very direct question to the to the government representative. What have you done, or, or what have you done to try to prevent the strategy that we're living in Mexico right now? And I also want to ask you another question. What do you intend to do? Because the truth is, we're leaving a, a, a horrible situation in Mexico, and um, we're, we are not receiving the support that we are that we should be getting as victims. We want to know what you're doing to find to to help us find our dear ones uh, that disappear. We're just a sample. We're just a, a, a speck of what's, what we're, what's being uh, experienced in Mexico. I, I want to re repeat, I want to remind, I want to insist, uh, it's four kids that I have lost. And I, for five years and five months, I've been looking for them. Uh, uh, 
we know that every all of those that are going uh, what has been discussed in all these nations is very important, but we are being skinned alive um, uh, day after day, and we don't get any support from our representatives, from our senators, in in terms of uh, our efforts to find our dear ones. I want to know, in the name of all my uh, brothers and sisters here, what what is it that you have done, and what are you going to do? Because we want you to. Um, to take responsibility for this. We've, we've been here, we've gone to Washington, we've gone everywhere that we can go, and not because they're giving us the, not because we're getting the support in Mexico, we're here because of the support that all of you as society in general, that you've been supporting us for these trips, so we can be uh, here in, uh, be, uh, in all the, and to try to get all the uh, possible changes that can help our society, because we know very well the United States and Mexico are tied together in many things. Why not come together in the effort to find our dear ones? I repeat, you are taking our lives away piece by piece. We don't know why or how. Uh, how is it that we are uh, still alive? We know your. We need your support. Um, uh, Mr. Representative, and and we need to see each other in Mexico so you can give us an answer. You tell us what are you gonna do, or what are you gonna what are you gonna promise? And, and not just promises, uh, please. Uh, and we want the real thing. We want to have our dears uh, once back. We don't know if they're alive or dead, or if they have something to eat, or they're getting treatment. I tell you, as a mother. I, I get treatment because I, I have a, doctor, a medical assistant, I have medicines, and I, and I have thousands of people around me that's that surround me, that give me support and take care of me. But my kids, tell me uh, about my kids. Uh, if I could know, how, if, if they are listening to me, I want them to know that my voice, I want my voice to reach them, that I never stop looking for them that each and every one of the mothers in Mexico are in the same situation and going through the same thing. So I take advantage of this now, that the fact that I'm here to tell you, uh, the representative, we want your help, not just yours, but all your uh, colleagues and all the people that are here in your uh, delegation. Thank you very much. There are some things that can't be fixed. There are other issues that we have to work on. To, to, to fix such deep hurt, such deep harm, is not possible. And we're talking about these absurd facets of the war on drugs, to think that a public health issue is going to be solved by war and violence and murder because War. That's the most painful and harmful thing that can exist, and the suffering that we see that we know is tremendous. I would like to uh, acknowledge civil society in Mexico, and of course the movement toward dignity and justice. I, re I, I want to acknowledge it and recognize it because what they've done, they have used their pain as a foundation to try to stop this organization. Calderon's war, in the first few years, they killed themselves at first. And the victims, were, it was said that the victims were guilty for their own murders. And they used, to, they used to treat victims as if they were responsible for that situation, for having been killed or, or 
adopted. And I think that one of the most important things that this movement has done is to uh, raise consciousness and, and make a society much more sensitive to the issue. The movement is very important. Uh, is, it's not only important for that sector, but for other sectors. Mexico needs and has to find a way to control crime. Where we are against this absurd war, the war against drugs. There are multiple organizations. Legislatively, what we've been able to do is to pass a Victims Act, a Victims Law, supported by your movement. You were a fundamental big happy. Felipe Calderon vetoed the law, and then we were able to achieve it. That's what we could do in the legislature. You, I know that's not enough. Of course it's not enough. And there are many um, lawmakers who are committed to ending this absurd war. We want to stop pursuing and, and, and persecuting users. The people who are making the most off the war against drugs are criminals. They are making the biggest profits. They are making so much money off the black market. And one way or another, they, it's not society. They have generated what they've generated. That conflict, that's what predominates, and it's, and, it, and, it, and it's heartbreaking. Of course, there are many other things we need to do. I think we need to set up a commission of truth, a commission of truth to investigate all the crimes that have been committed, all the injustice. But I have to repeat, justice will always be partial, because to fix pain, to make pain go away is impossible. But what should be done should be done. And we have to maintain good memory so that we don't forget history and make the same mistakes. And if we want to get out of this vicious cycle and not let it happen, not let the same thing happen again, we have to do something different. And therefore, we have to change the policy and the paradigm against drugs. And of course, we have to for people who have been abducted and have disappeared, and we have to, we have to fight so that somehow the, the dirty war of the 70s can, can give us something back that we can find some of those uh, sons and daughters that disappeared. We have to find other things to do, it's true. You, you have the support of many of us who are here, or many other legislators, and of course, they are very willing. And, we have, and, and you have the support of thousands and millions of Mexicans, and we want to try and get something from this painful lesson, and not to let people forget what's happened in this absurd, tragic war against drugs that's existed for practically half a century. Which, you know, it started more or less in the same year that the International Narcotics uh, Treaty was signed. Many people have grown up with this paradigm, and many of us have felt the pain of losing people, and we haven't been able to get what we wanted to get. After so many decades, it would be ridiculous to continue the same, along the same path. And you are the engine of change. We also will have to find a way to talk, and of course, we recognize your fight, your struggle for your cause, and all the work that you've done, and how you have turned your pain into strength. Thank you. Mexico, of course, where we live, we are very familiar with the war against on drugs. From Colombia, what we can say is the victims are the, the people who have been most impacted, not just mothers, but the kids who are missing in the street, who dress a certain way, or are driving or have a certain look and 
there in their jail arbitrarily just because people get their substance users and they send to a juvenile court equivalent to Bogota where they there are a lot of, um, mis there's a lot of mistreatment and abuse in that system. And a lot of people are against that system. But we're just looking at the uh, beginning of change, of course. There was a report that came out in Colombia recently on fumigation of certain crops and how it's affecting pregnant women and other people who are exposed to those fumigations. And those are some of the other people who suffer the the most uh, in our country. We working on the grassroots level because somebody may ask that question. To, to work on a strategy that we're trying to build is maybe, maybe users are, 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 are gaining voice in the press, in the media, they have more access to being heard. We're trying to create bridges of solidarity with growers. And it's been tough. Um, the, the, the organizations are, are, are dynamic. They're different from the organizations here, but it's been talked about a lot in Colombia, the new ways to get organized and new tools to be able to organize. And they respond to different realities and different ideas in, in rural areas and compared to urban areas. In the rural areas, there are different types of victims of the war on drugs. But we are creating strategies. We're trying to articulate these strategies to visualize and solve other problems because, for example, Colombia, we've never, um, users never were able to express themselves like is happening now. They're being asked to, to participate in drug reform policy. And who's there? It's everyone along the supply chain. I wanted to say a couple of things before we. Uh, discuss uh, Brazil and, and uh, about what you ask. Uh, in terms of the social movements, and there is a very important thing that we have done for a long time. The issue of the change on drug policy came, was coming from the perspective of individual rights, the freedom, the right of your body, that I can do whatever I want with my body, which is an important debate, but we have to recognize that in Latin America, it's not, it, that's not a debate that gets uh, uh, much of a hearing. Uh, that, that's not a part of the history of Latin America. Then you have some countries that uh, they start to put forward the issue of, well, there is a, this violence uh, that's generated by this, and this is not an efficient way to deal with the drug issue. Uh, on the contrary, uh, this is a war that, is, that generates more violence. Uh, so to deal with the issue of violence, we have to we have to change that policy, and that I think that gets that gets more that has the higher resonance that that, that has uh, in terms of changing drug policy. That I think is key in a continent where political forces that uh, put forward the issue of inequity as a central issue to talk about a debate. To talk about uh, inequities. It's a logic that here in the United States uh, it appears as a, the issue comes forward in a stronger way than other ways to, to speak here, to speak that it's a policy that jails blacks, that jails uh, uh, those that are worth more, that, uh, that generate more uh, inequality. Uh, it's something that in Latin America doesn't, does, it's not put forward in this way, but it doesn't appear the same way, but it's very common in Latin America and Brazil in general, in Latin America in general, that uh, if they are, they are coming from the less, they talk about inequality as a central issue as part of their uh, perspective, but they don't see the war against drug as a central issue. They don't identify the, the, war, the, uh, the war against drug as one of the central uh, as one of the key issues that create in, in, inequality in, in society. So I think this, that is one of the uh, issues that we should discuss to, be, to bring about uh, um, that, uh, the logic of that discussion fully forward. And, and in Brazil, but this is the, the lab, is something that I have discussed this, but uh, there's many, we have gained a lot of ground, but there is a lot of uh, um, um, 
much conservatism, there is no perspective for changes, uh, uh, there is much discussion among the um, uh, health uh, care system, uh, but there are many uh, avenues to discuss, but I think it's very important that we put forward in Brazil as one of the central issues um, as part of the debate on, on drug policy. Maybe take, um, take on some of one more issue that was mentioned. Uh, of course, I'm in agreement uh, with uh, Pedro's analysis about how social movements have uh, taken part of this and and what their uh, political message is and how we can have to integrate it. In the last few years, some human rights issues that work in the region with, uh, with different issues have um, involved themselves more in the issue of drugs, especially in the southern part of the continent. All the human rights organizations are, are very uh, much associated with the uh, uh, the suffering that we, uh, what we experienced through the dictatorships. Uh, I'm talking about, I mean, it's about the human rights issues uh, in the southern part of the continent. But uh, more recently, they have taken part, they, they have uh, got more involved and we're working jointly. And in fact, there's many joint statements that have been published that have, uh, that have gone uh, that had come about uh, alongside with uh, uh, some of the, um, the in the Human Rights Commission, the, the General, General Human Rights Commission uh, of the UN uh, that took place in the Guatemala as, as part of the discussion on drug policy. Now, a very strong organization, so an international organization uh, in the uh, region of the Andes. Uh, there is um, uh, there is exchanges between the those uh, producers, the legal producers, to, to try to generate uh, work that is done on a regional basis uh, to, to try to uh, carry out uh, discussions that are carried out in the in the regions. So we're kind of carrying out work along those lines as well. So the drug organization, you probably know that uh, there is an international association of uh, drug consumers, and last year uh, it was, and uh, LAMPUT was officially formed last year, which is the Latin American Red, the Latin American network of uh, uh, people that consume drugs. And I want to say something in relationship to churches as well. Many of us have a uh, um, relationship with churches, and we know that churches are different. Nevertheless, I think it's true that we, for the first time, we, we have a Pope, a Latin American Pope, in this case, and my friend is Argentinian, and he has had a big impact in the region, and everything that he says has a lot, has a big impact in the region. Nevertheless, it's important that we rescue the older, um, uh, uh, the other uh, perspectives that the churches put forward uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a group of uh, Catholic universities in Latin America uh, put forward a very progressive, published a very progressive document making recommend, recommending changes from drug policy. The, the document uh, was signed by the uh, research, uh, the, uh, the Institute of, the, of uh, Catholic, Catholic Universities. It's, in, it's important that we recognize uh, such organization. They don't have the the religious community doesn't have a, mon, uh, a monolithic. Uh, it's not a monolith. Uh, they have different perspectives, and it's important we recognize that. Uh, well, um, I want to ask a question. We are in the in the country that is the creation of the um, prohibition policy, and uh, and this has had a, a, an impact worldwide. And, and I want to ask if there's been changes recently, and especially specifically, Julio, what what's been the response of the United States to the uh, Uruguayan proposal? and what has been in, in, a, in a global level, what's going to be the arguments that Uruguay is going to put forward to defend its proposal? Yes. Before, I want to make reference to the, uh, to the 
international movements in Uruguay we're in the situation that we are because the uh, executive power took the initiative to put forward uh, a bill and that has uh, substantially changed the, the rhythm of the game uh, in Parliament. We have two, initi two initiatives that were in Parliament to try to regulate the, the market in a different way, the, um, uh, um, the, uh, having their own plants and, and having and creating clubs for, for the cultivation, the organization that work in the, in the, in the drugs, the, uh, government organization have been putting forward for some time now that drug consumption should not be uh, an issue, but uh, it's not a criminal issue, but it's a it's a health issue. And, uh, and right now, uh, what came about is a, it's a new way to carry out politics uh, by the different movements. The, they are the ones that the ones that put the issue on the table. Uh, we we cannot. And we say uh, that when we talk about, about, about war, we're talking about that this is the continuation of politics by other means. Uh, and we're talking about politics in general. And, we're talking about, and politics had to do with uh, struggles, uh, with power struggles, for uh, uh, for the symbols of power, for uh, for uh, territorial po uh, power, for economic power. And we have to interject all these things because otherwise we're just talking about a small. We're only talking about the small aspects of reality. If that reality uh, needs to be uh, needs needs. Uh, the participation, the collective uh, participation, um, uh, none of it is going to be possible uh, unless you, ha uh, you have the collective participation like it happened here in Colorado. No changes in our perspective are going to be able to take place if you don't have an effort by all the different actors that are in favor of change. And, and uh, like Pedro said recently, uh, in politics in general, so, uh, uh, where you have everything or nothing, well, it's just nothing. Um, it's, we have to advance and create platforms uh, in accord that will make possible uh, change, the, the road towards change. And I think that's fundamental. I think that uh, in our case, in our own way, that uh, well, um, well, we've, we maybe we're ahead of in relationship to other countries, but we have to be conscious of the fact that this is the beginning of a process, that maybe in 30 or 40 years, those of us will be able to enjoy it. Uh, those guys were believing in prehistoric times, uh, they might say. Um, but we have to start from the, from, from the starting point that the um, war itself is a political concept, and we don't have to, we don't have, we can't discuss this in a naive way or, or, uh, or just uh, part of it. Um, in, in a political, we have to address all the issues uh, in a political way, in a cultural uh, level, in the the way that political parties are organized. Uh, you debate it, uh, and in the inter internationally. Uh, and as Hannah was put, uh, was uh, saying, there's now Uruguay. It's a state that has a different situation uh, from. Uh, than Colorado because we are we're a nation and, and uh, Colorado is a it's a state within a nation we have to give different answers today but there is a there's a issue that it's in the in the background uh, this is carrying out this is being carried out in in a uh, and it's speeding up. It's not. It's not just the issue that's been. It's accelerating. It's not just to uh, enough to put forward in Uruguay and in the in South, in South America. And some of you might not even know where it is. This is going to have a. It's a, It's going to have a substantial impact. What's happening in. Uh, what's happening in in Colorado and in Washington? What they can. Because what they can tell us, they're going to have to tell the same thing, say the same thing to the federal, to the federal government in Washington. What each one of you does in one of your states, it's a, it, it's a significant contribution to take a step towards uh, having a relationship, a relationship in the next few years that, that is going to be um, um, fundamental.
that uh, it's kind of as it was said before what comes out of the drug conference in uh, in 2006 in relationship to the war on drugs has to be different um, it has to be different because otherwise it, it will mean a step back and it had to do with like which one I want to do each one of you does in your own country whether you're as part of a small organization a pressure group uh, it counts uh, it has to be part of an effort that um, to to be able to achieve to be able to make possible that uh, the nation states be able to respond, to be able to respond to sovereign policies um, as long as we don't do damage to any other countries. And what's happening with this kind of, with these policies, with this policy now, that illegal production and the illegal market that is completely dominated um, by drug traffic. Uh, what happens in one country hurts another another country. We don't we don't produce marijuana. We don't produce cocaine. Uh, in cocaine, no drugs are, pro are produced on a large scale. But never nevertheless, we have them all. Uh, so this is a policy that uh, uh, causes some countries to because they, they're omitted or because they don't have the power to do it do harm to another. Um, and this is, uh, uh, and the other thing is that the, the, uh, on top of that you have the structure of the uh, drug markets that don't have any control of, by any state institutions, they don't, they don't have any participation of society, they're completely controlled by the criminal organizations, uh, they're the ones who set all the conditions and they, are, they have penalized all the substances. Uh, and that's the uh, that's the spear point that that we have to use to uh, to project uh, this. So we're in a transition. Right? It can it can it can um, affect things one way or the other. Uh, if this transition uh, generalizes uh, it, 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 it generalizes the. Uh, into something that is completely dominated by the industrial uh, organizations that have with uh, um, marketing uh, and uh, we're going to end up in it with their marketing and, and control we're going to end up in a situation where uh, similar to the consumption of tobacco with, uh, and that would be as bad and as great as the, the recession because of the recession of the right now Thank, Thank you. you so much we had some other questions. She's going to go down to um, get some questions on this side. I wanted to give a Central American context because it's very different. I'm the only Central American in this group. Our organization is the first one of the civil society that was formed legally to work to reform drug policy. In El Salvador, like um, the lady said, there's one church. Well, we work with a lot of evangelical churches more than anything else. Not necessarily those churches, but they're the only ones who deal with people in the street. Uh, harm reduction is generally um, led by very religious and very well-trained people, people who are very charitable. But they work uh, in, the, on the, in the areas of poverty, but also in harm reduction. And so I think there's some difference from in our country that you have a better um, developed movement uh, developed. And in Central America, it hasn't developed as, as well. We aren't dealing with that yet, even though we know that um, we have very high uh, murder rates. Us. So it gives us hope that uh, we'll be able to mobilize more change throughout our continent and to draw closer and join together with other countries on a regional level. Unfortunately, we only have five minutes left, so I'm going to ask you to ask very short questions and please some very short responses. Thank you all for sharing your perspectives with us. My question has to do with how the governments are collecting data on drug users. I'm doing a study on drug ob observers in Brazil and Colombia, and I think the Uruguayan board has had the same experience. They're not doing studies amongst the street people, and that's a big problem because, as we know, most people who are affected by drug um, the, the, the harder drugs are uh, 
minors under 18 years old, some of them, many of them start at the age of 11, and that demographic, we're not able to analyze that problem. Do any of you have any opinion about how we can create a change in that aspect? Thank you very much. Um, friend in New York, one thing that disturbs me after the Newtown, Connecticut shootings almost a year ago, where 27 tragic people have lost their lives, is compared to the carnage that was described in Mexico, 27 is a very minor number compared to all, all the deaths because of the war of the United the war on the of the United States insist on export. I feel like some of the people in Newtown have 20 20 vision when they want to see something, and their blind is fast when they don't want to see something. But um, I think one outlet to influence the American people is that they're so upset about Newtown today, you need to confront them on the that, That's an end where you can confront them on the tragedies in Mexico, in Colombia, and elsewhere. this aspect of rights to life and health that's happening in Colombia. Um, we see the need to bring together community collective work. What's going on with those organizations in, in that situation? Thank you. We're going to take <coughs> questions because you can talk to everybody who's here afterwards, too. I'm co-founder of LEAP. Do you, any of you, have an opinion in South America that it's time now to change the drug laws because given that the United States allow, is allowing legalization in Colorado and in other states of our country, do uh, you think you can change marijuana laws in, in your countries? What do you think? Thank you, Alejandro, and then we've got one minute to answer. This is a question for Representative Balaun Saran. Uh, it's, it's this. You talked about the Victims Act. The Victims Act is a palliative, and the harm that's occurring to a large degree is this because of official violence, or is it because the government is incapable of responding to violence in different areas? So if you all have this on the table, I'm asking, do you have it on the table? Are you dealing with the possibility of creating new reforms? Or are you going to pursue with the reforms that came from the prior government that actually reduced rights, or reforms that are going to make actions of the justice system more transparent? I mean, uh, prosecutors have been used politically. We saw that during Calderon's um, regimen, regime, and we've seen it in different parts of Mexico where the prosecutors are using politics. When are they going to separate those powers? Okay. We've got four minutes for answers to those four questions. Okay, well, let me answer partially some of these questions. First of all, about the issue of gathering information about consumers. Yes, definitely. We have a problem, a uh, very complicated problem about this, among other things, because the information that we have about uh, drug consumption in Colombia is based on uh, the national census and, uh, and, and, and also interviews that we carry uh, uh, that don't have. Into account, they don't take into account uh, uh, the folks in the streets, and uh, we have found out to be able to carry out these studies uh, effectively. We don't know exactly how many. Um, 
the uh, consum consumers of uh, cocaine base, uh, we have cocaine base, we have it, and, and there's a high number uh, of uh, cocaine based consumers. And in terms of the or uh, organizations, uh, there's one important thing to say in the Colombian context that we have the president that he spends a lot of time in the media talking about a change, that opening a debate, that has uh, special sessions in the UN, but he's very, he's not very willing to get outside of the Colombian con um, context, and, it has, and this country has a lot to do with that, with that issue. And, that, and this, uh, this issue is the link to not only the use of pesticides, but to, the, the, to uh, broaden uh, the uh, borders of the ter territorial production. Uh, and that's, this is some of the things that we're dealing with in, in Colombia. Uh, uh, now, that you also have the proposal to give authority to the um, to the uh, there are also some proposals to to give more power to the prosecutors to, to give more uh, to give more powers to the police and, and to the prosecutors, and we have to work jointly to, to uh, stop from going going backwards. One of the things that the uh, that is very important that we can fight against uh, um, for legalization. I had very good impressions from the tours that we uh, some of the things that we do in Colorado. There is a high level of uh, know-how, um, and I was able to see all the other but I, I thought uh, it wasn't just uh, because I had a feeling of injustice because what's happening here is being uh, legalized and uh, people are being uh, people are getting killed in our countries and uh, people are getting killed because of the policies that this country imposed on us. First they prohibited because it was not in their business and now it's going to be their business and now the possibilities are open. There is a um, um, ho horrible irony there, um, uh, a dark irony there that I, 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 I don't but I think that that doesn't stop it. We have to change. We have to move forward. We have to. Uh, has, it has a nonsensical. It's been a nonsensical approach, uh, and, and we have to change that. Uh, with policy. Well, very briefly, in terms of the question that Hannah made, we haven't received any pressure from the government of the United States, and we have. Receive press, we have received support and, and we continue to, say, uh, to get support from the OAS to monitor the policy that we're going to carry forward. In terms of the investigate, um, the research, uh, I, I can't generalize in, um, in Uruguay, but we have carried out a research uh, uh, at the community level to, to try to, just, uh, to justify the policy that we're carrying out. Uh, the, the consumption of uh, cocaine, uh, those that most use, uh, the average age is 26, and consumption about minors is very little. In terms of regional organizations, we're working in uh, UNASUR and the OAS, and we have to bring the debates uh, to those uh, organizations, and we have to see uh, what the, the, what's in the insults that report uh, can wait to be discussed and to be able to uh, for uh, uh, and men in and also in the United States. Well, well, we're uh, we like the fact that everybody's interested, uh, but we, unfortunately we have to end this. But we encourage everyone to approach the panelists and to continue the discussion. Uh, if you can, uh, uh, if you can leave the equipment in the back there and your evaluations in the back. At 12.15, there is an international uh, plenary. We're going to listen from Portugal, from Uruguay, from the Czech Republic, and others. And, and, and also, if you're interested in the Latin American uh, issue uh, about the, the Bay Drug, there's going to be a community uh, discussion at uh, 5.30s in your program. You can also attend that. Uh, there are many different uh, avenues for you to continue to discuss. It's very interesting. I think it was good. And uh, it was helpful to have one of those Oh, yeah. And yeah. that same speech that he